Thank you, Jim, for those words and that introduction. Hello, everyone. Bonjour à tous. Uh, talking to you from Ottawa, from uh, unceded Algonquin territory. Uh, it's great to be here with you, Jim, uh, but also with Terry, Kevin, and Dan uh, on our team as strong voices for Manitoba. Um, I want to start by saying to everyone here, thank you. Uh, thank you for being there for people when they need it most. Your dedication, your skill, your compassion are remarkable at any given time. Uh, but this past year has been extraordinarily demanding of you uh, and of your colleagues across the province and across the country. Uh, this past year, you've been asked to rise to a challenge that no one could have expected. Uh, and even though you chose careers and certainly signed up for caring, uh, for being there, for going above and beyond in service to others, nobody signed up for a pandemic. And you have answered the call in an extraordinary way, uh, which is why that's this year's theme for National Nursing Week. Je sais aussi qu'il y a beaucoup de jeunes qui se joignent à nous aujourd'hui, des étudiantes, des étudiants en soins infirmiers qui s'impliquent, qui continuent de voir à quel point c'est important d'être là pour servir les autres. Et je vous remercie du choix que vous avez fait et d'être parmi nous aujourd'hui. The third wave of this pandemic is hitting Manitoba and Winnipeg really hard. And I know all of you are part of the efforts to ramp up critical care in response. As a federal government, we'll continue to be here with whatever you need to get through this. Well over half a million vaccine doses delivered to Manitoba so far, with many more on the way. The Canadian Armed Forces are helping with vaccinations in Manitoba First Nations. We continue to deliver rapid tests and PPE to the front lines. Et en plus, on investit des milliards de dollars afin que les Canadiens puissent obtenir les chirurgies, les traitements dont ils ont besoin et qui ont été retardés à cause de la pandémie. Uh, we've continued to be there uh, with supports from the federal government and we will continue to be there uh, with supports uh, for you, uh, for healthcare in general, uh, but also for professionals on the front lines uh, right across the province. This third wave is hard but it's no match uh, for the resilience and strength of Canadians, particularly frontline workers, particularly frontline health workers, particularly nurses. You are extraordinary, uh, even as you are uh, feeling worn down uh, and exhausted uh, like everyone else. This has been really hard. Uh, and we just want it to be behind us, but we know it's not. We know there are still tough weeks ahead of us. Uh, and uh, please know uh, that we will continue to be there to support you uh, in any way possible, uh, not just the federal government, but all Canadians. Thank you for everything you're doing for our loved ones, for our communities, uh, and we'll get through this together. Uh, with that, I'm happy to pass it back to Terry to get the conversation started. Well, thank you, uh, Prime Minister, for those words uh, of appreciation, which I know uh, we all uh, feel. And, and so, folks, uh, we have representatives from eight nurses groups uh, with us today. So each group will have about uh, three or so minutes uh, to speak, after which uh, the Prime Minister may respond. And I'd ask you to uh, keep to the time so we can hear from uh, each and every group. And after we've heard from everyone, we'll have a, a question and comment session, a, a conversation with the PM and an opportunity for some of you who didn't get a chance to speak uh, in the in the first round. So so let's start with uh, Pam Friesen from the Association of Regulated Nurses of Manitoba. Pam. Thank you. Good afternoon. As a critical care nurse, it is an honor to speak on behalf of the Association of Regulated Nurses of Manitoba today. After a year of this pandemic, I, like every nurse, have many stories to tell of the challenges of working and living through the COVID-19 pandemic. I will speak briefly about my personal experiences because I want to take this opportunity to share with you two issues that I believe the pandemic has highlighted. The most challenging part of nursing during the the pandemic for me has been enforcing, enforcing the visitor policies. Restrictions are necessary to limit the spread of COVID, but can you imagine how difficult it is to look into the eyes of a grieving wife who yesterday was planning the future with her partner and asking her to choose which three of her four children she will pick to say goodbye to their father before he dies? Or to watch the steady decline of a patient knowing that by the time special permission for visitation will be granted, the patient will no longer be aware of their visitors 
no longer able to squeeze the hands of their loved ones or acknowledge their presence in any way. My stories are not unlike the stories told by other ICU nurses across our country when pleading with the public to follow public health orders. The pandemic has, in my eyes and the eyes of my peers, highlighted some ongoing issues. During this pandemic, ICU nurses have cared for double or triple their pre-pandemic patient loads. These patient loads make me worry that I can't provide the best care that patients deserve. For example, it has been a very real fear that a patient may die because their norepinephrine bag would run dry before it is changed. Norepinephrine is a continuously infused potent blood vessel constrictor that maintains a life-sustaining blood pressure. Another example is that patients sometimes accidentally disconnect themselves from their ventilator, struggle to breathe, and may die before reattached to their ventilator. With the current circumstances, the possibility of these two scenarios occurring is significantly increased. We as nurses understand this is a pandemic and we will do what must be done at this time. However, for the long-term post-pandemic plan, nurse-patient ratios must be established to provide Manitobans with the high quality of care they deserve and have come to expect. The pandemic has shown that asking an ICU nurse to care for more patients means that lives are at greater risk. Another point this pandemic has drawn attention to is the high level of nursing knowledge and education required to properly train IC or properly care for ICU patients. There are fewer baseline critical care beds and therefore fewer critical care nurses. Now our healthcare system is less capable of handling any additional stressors such as a novel coronavirus. Decreased baseline beds meant there were fewer critical care nurses available to care for the surge in patients requiring ICU care. Plans were made to accommodate the increased demand for ICU beds. Supplies were purchased and physical spaces set up for patient admission. But a highly skilled intensive care nurse cannot be purchased from a supplier. It takes time to prepare an intensive care nurse. Intensive care nurses provide treatments and use machines and medications that are beyond the scope of basic education. More important than being able to use specialized equipment is the assessment and interpretation skills that are heavily relied upon by critical care teams. The continued professional development of Manitoba nurses is necessary to provide the complexity of care our most critically ill patients need. I thank you again for this opportunity to share issues identified by bedside critical care nurses who care for real Manitobans in life and death situations. Thank you, Pam. Um, obviously, the, the stress on resources has been extraordinary right now, and so much of it has fallen on, on your and your colleagues' shoulders. Uh, uh, when, when there is a, a gap in scheduling or when there's uh, someone slow to come in, um, we know what ends up happening. You end up working longer. You end up filling those gaps with your own uh, abilities in all so many cases, uh, which is stretching you out and and putting a, an un, uh, unforgivable burden on, on you and on your families as well. And, and that is something we have to uh, work together to address. Like I said, the federal government fully respects provincial areas of, uh, of jurisdiction over healthcare delivery. Uh, but at the same time, we have stepped up with billions of dollars in transfers to the provinces for health right now, but we're also going to embark upon uh, long-term funding discussions with the provinces as we get through with this. Uh, and uh, there is a need for more money in healthcare across the country, and that money will come from the federal government. Uh, uh, but we need to make sure that it gets used the right ways to support people with all the learnings that we've had uh, of this crisis and the gaps that we've seen. And I look forward to working with, uh, with all of you and your associations in making sure uh, that we are figuring out the right level of partnership accountability and consistency across the country in the way things move forward. So those are, uh, those are conversations ahead and they'll certainly be informed by uh, uh, the, the difficult and I know heart-wrenching experiences that uh, you and, and your colleagues have gone through. So thank you for sharing today, Pam. Well, thank you, Pam and Prime Minister. Uh, um, now uh, we'd like to hear from Christina Hernandez from the Manitoba Nurses Union. Uh, Christina. 
Okay. Um, hi, everybody. Thank you for having me here today. Uh, I'd like to thank the Nurses Union for inviting me, a recent graduate of the critical care program, to represent them. It is a testament to how the union believes that frontline nurses deserve a spot at the table where decisions about healthcare are made. Uh, and that's what I'd like to focus on for the next minute or so. So as you all know, the pandemic showed the strength and vulnerabilities in our healthcare system. It showed that in the face of catastrophe of epic proportion, nurses will respond and put patients first. We are not only utmost caring, but adaptable and collaborative under pressure. We have also unfortunately seen the fragility of our healthcare system and that nurses are not immune to the consequences of this pandemic. Having shown up every day with the goal of placing Canadians and specifically Manitobans before our own well being, nurses and other frontline healthcare workers are facing tremendous challenges. It's happening today, right now, as I speak before you. Nurses are at work caring for not only the patients that we served prior to the pandemic, but the influx of patients that have come through our doors. We are also caring for our patients' family members who unexpectedly cannot be at the bedside. And we are also trying to care for each other and manage the trauma associated with working the front line during this pandemic for over a year. Only then can we begin to think of our families and then lastly, ourselves. Nurses are human and subject to the collective human, human experience of emotions. We experienced the same fear of the unknown when this pandemic began and fear for our loved ones in our greater community. We've also lived a very unique and intimate experience with this pandemic as frontline workers. We have battled very real life or death situations around this virus with impossible staffing levels or resources. We are tired and concerned about the future. Despite the challenges and fears, we are still showing up and we still continue to provide the best care possible. This is what nurses do. As a group, nurses' adaptability and collaborative nature have demonstrated again, like in the past, how qualified nurses are to pioneer the future of Canadian healthcare system. During this pandemic, we provided care in what seems like impossible circumstances and under authority that was surprised to learn lacked a true understanding of this system. Can you imagine the strides that we as a society could make if nurses were afforded the respect and positions of power necessary to make significant contributions at decision-making tables? Can you imagine what a system that values the input of its most frontline workers who tackle these challenges every day could look like? What I can tell you is that it is a system that would value the human experience of healthcare, that would uphold the standard of the Canadian Health Act which includes public administration, comprehensiveness, universality, portability, and accessibility. And I can tell you that it would also be a system that is fiscally responsible. <laughs> an investment in the public health care system and in nurses is genuinely an investment in the greater good of Canadian society, and nurses are here for it. We have been here the entire time, and the pandemic has shown that we are not only capable, but ideally positioned to get the job done. We bring the skills, education, and experience necessary to work with all levels of government to better our healthcare system. So I'm going to end, but I don't want to end on Happy Nurses Week because most of us are not in a position or state to celebrate. But I will end on thank you for having me here and thank you to all my colleagues across the province and the country for everything that you have done. Thank you, Christina, and uh, I look forward to continuing uh, this conversation uh, with a lot of uh, input from you and your colleagues as we uh, as we try to build back better and learn the terrible lessons of this pandemic. Thanks for everything you've done. Uh, next up, Prime Minister is Shauna Watt Dorshield uh, from the Nurse Practitioner Association of Manitoba. Shauna. Good afternoon. Thank you very much for um, inviting the Nurse Practitioner Association. Um, I'm um, one of the members and as our committee um, uh, addresses it um, as I am a nurse practitioner. Um, I just wanted to um, just discuss a few things that we have um, ideally found that are not working well um, in for us in the nurse practitioner world. Um, I think one of the big things is that we want um, the government to really um, acknowledge that nurse practitioners play a vital role in our healthcare system, um, that we are not uh, assistants to doctors. Um, we provide the same care and level of care, um, especially in the primary care system. We currently um, 
only have, I think it's around 250 nurse practitioners in Manitoba. Uh, we con constantly hear from our clients that um, they would like to have a, a care for, for them for themselves by a nurse practitioner, but there's none available in their communities. Um, there's many communities, I work in Parkland, and there's many communities that are not accepting new clients. So we have the pushes, of course, is to have a primary care provider um, for um, every individual. And places like um, Brandon, Manitoba, as well as Dauphin, um, there's no primary care provider providing care, um, taking new clients. So that in itself is a, a lack of um, a lack of a big barrier to um, care. In regards to specifically COVID, I, I guess what I would say is because of the lack of nurse practitioners in primary care throughout Manitoba, and most of us that are in primary care are um, employed by the RHAs. We um, we do often we have our own full time caseloads in our own communities. And some of us work in independent clinics with no other um, provider with us. And we are often um, pulled um, from our own caseloads to um, fill in gaps um, in the healthcare system. So things like um, we're being pulled in to be redeployed to the COVID test sites, to flu clinics, to COVID test sites, um, to long-term care facilities. And all of these previously mentioned um, duties, they are definitely um, required and, and need a nurse, but definitely are not using the scope of practice um, of a nurse practitioner. And when we get pulled to these other areas, our communities are suffering. We do not have, um, that creates barriers to services to our own clients. Their healthcare needs are pushed back. Um, we definitely don't, um, aren't able to provide the service that we need to our own clients. The other piece is that, of course, the constant change of um, the recommendations, um, sometimes coming from the provincial um, standards or the provincial recommendations are different than the provincial uh, recommendations. Um, when we're working in a clinic that has um, other disciplines such as doctors, they get their own um, direction from Doctors Manitoba, whereas we get different uh, recommendations from our, the RHA. So we often you know, are at an odds with the other people working in our, on, even in our work site of, as to who's screening, um, who's, who can book a, an in-person appointment versus an, um, a virtual appointment. Um, there's lots of confusion happening. The other piece I guess I just want to mention is that um, when PPE was discussed <clears throat> and um, there was, um, we were having to reuse or prolong use of our surgical masks and we were having uh, people coming in, they hadn't got screened properly, they were symptomatic, we weren't, uh, we didn't have access to, we were allowed one um, mask per shift for a nine hour shift. Um, we were told to um, put them in paper bags. Um, you know, we, it was deemed that community or, or primary care was not um, in the hot spots. Um, therefore, we were um, having to account and we still have to account and send in every week, we have to send in um, the number of masks we used. So they're not readily available. Um, many of us had tried to get N95s for when we had clients that come in symptomatic, and it has only been in the in the last two months that we are, have been able to be accessing N95s because they, we were told that they were only for hospital use. Um, the other thing that um, I work in rural um, um, Ma Manitoba, and with the pandemic, there's been lots. I also work in First Nations communities. And because of COVID, um, there has been a lot of barriers placed for clients to get health. So um, sometimes um, people don't have transportation, for instance, on a First Nations community. They're not able to get to their appointments, get to the hospital, get to their specialist, get to see me. Um, if they don't have their own transportation, um, the health offices are, are only able to have one person ride in the van um, because of the COVID restrictions. And even um, 
the fact of trying to get um, people in to obtain um, the abortion pill or their opiate uh, agnus therapy. Um, there's limitations on the clinics and their availability. So I guess I just want to, you know, my, my final comment, I guess, would be to ha have the government acknowledge the, the important role nurse practitioners play and all the um, flexibility, I guess, that we have had and that we are hoping to build more capacity in our communities with nurse practitioners and um, work with um, all of the other disciplines to guess that to provide the best care we can. Thank you very much for inviting us. Thank you, Shona, uh, for sharing. I think that you said uh, a, a lot uh, that is uh, worthy to reflect on. And I think one of the one of the frames that I see is as we move forward, uh, we need to understand that yes, there's going to be an important role for institutions and hospitals to play. But the more we can base uh, health services in uh, in the communities, uh, the more we understand and build a flexible system that is uh, that is closer and more uh, engaged to where uh, where citizens are and less institutional as the one way of delivering health health care the better off we're going to be that's where we're going i think this uh, pandemic like it has in so many areas uh, has accelerated reflections around that hopefully for the better now we just need to make sure we follow up on that so uh, thank you for everything you've you've done and you've shared well thank you prime minister and you've met this uh uh, next speaker on a previous uh, Zoom with uh, our friend Kevin Lamru, uh, Dan Carlo Buenaventura is from the Philippine Nurses Association of, of Manitoba. Dan, magandang hapon. Magandang hapon, Mr. Uh, Member of the Parliament, uh, Terry Dugid. Honorable Prime Minister JT and honorable members of the <laughs> Parliament, fellow uh, nurses, good afternoon to all of you. Um, so I represent the Filipino Nurses Association of Manitoba. I am an internationally educated nurse originally from the Philippines. I now work at the Health Sciences Center and, and, um, in a medicine unit and also as a travel nurse. All I can say is I am truly blessed. I feel that I'm truly blessed to be nursing in Canada. The one reason I say that is because I could attest to the abundance of support that the government is providing for the healthcare workers. Um, the system may not be perfect, but I do appreciate all the efforts and the help, starting from the uh, the PPE that the government is providing us to be able to render care safely to our patients, to the uh, timely imp uh, imposing of the uh, implementing of the policies, the education that gets to us right on time so that we would know exactly how to care for and nurse for patients who are infected and, and affected by COVID and for, for us to be able to help protect ourselves and be be healthy and be able to come back healthy to our families. I do appreciate all those um, all those help and effort from the government. Um, this is truly this really has been a challenging and sad times for everybody. I have seen passing of patients in my in my uh, few years working as a nurse so many times, but over the last year have been have been different. I have never been witness to patients dying by themselves. And um, those patients who are dying on their own, <laughs> sorry. <clears throat> um, who have been dying only, uh, who have been who have been in the bed of death, and uh, and have been only with us for uh, for that particular time at the bedside. I have not seen the smile on my coworkers' faces for a very long time, and quite frankly, I've actually forgotten some of some some of them and how they completely look like without their without their PPE. These are only some of the challenges that the uh, that the pandemic had had brought along in our nursing in our nursing profession and and daily grind. But some of the more burdening uh, challenges that we still face, I think, are rooting uh, deep towards the uh, are, are deep are, are deeply rooted on the staffing issues. And uh, nurses have been working long hours, time after time. And I think some of my colleagues here have mentioned that already. And we have been stretched so so thinly um, that some of us are 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 have been emotionally and physically uh, tired over over the last year. I also would like to mention about the uh, the red tape again amongst the um, with the registration process amongst the international educated nurses that the regulatory bodies have control over with. 
we have uh, the province have lost many nurses. The IENs have been have been going through. The IENs originally were nominated to work and and, and live in Manitoba, had decided to go to other provinces, uh, particularly in Ontario and the Maritime provinces, because they find that the registration process there is somehow much more fairer than what we have here in Manitoba. Um, although for although I for one and and of course I know that many of us nurses have pledged to come and work for our patients and as we say we will answer the call day in and day out eight hours or, or, or twelve hour shifts whatever shift that is whoever we have to care for whatever age race religion beliefs whatever whatever kind of illness we will be there um, but of course uh, we we are asking uh, that the government to please continue to support us, Mr. Prime Minister. We haven't had the collective agreement for many years now. And mm -hmm. that alone is something that, you know, uh, would I know would boost the morale of, of many of the nurses and show that the that the nurses are, are are looked after and are taken care of by our government. And again, I would like to to say that I sincerely appreciate all the efforts that you are continuously providing us. Um, lastly, I uh, would like to um, to to thank again the members of the uh, Parliament for inviting me over in our organization to speak on behalf of the internationally educated nurses that are working here in Manitoba, caring for our beloved Manitobans. And uh, thank you, Mabuhay. Thank you, Dan Carlo. It's uh, good to see you again, and uh, thank you for reminding us that. Uh, even as you guys are heroes and almost superheroes in uh, in your daily lives to to, to families, to suffering Canadians, um, you are also all too human. And the accumulation of tragedies, of of you know the stark reality that uh, that we are you know dealing with, and uh, the fears that you have for your families and your communities are are uh, are extremely uh, impactful. Uh, on you as well. So, so thanks for for highlighting that and and showing that you uh, uh, you are uh, uh, leading with your heart uh, as always, as as so many nurses do. Um, but also that there's lots more work to do, including uh, uh, on you know provincial conversations. But like I said, the federal government will be there uh, to uh, to help make uh, that decision easier by provinces to give proper support to uh, to the healthcare system and the people who. Uh, have, uh, have done extraordinary work within it. So thank you, Dan Carlo. With us uh, from the L'Ecole des Sciences Infirmières et des Etudes de la Santé, uh, René Pichet. René? Merci, Monsieur Duguid. Bonne, bonne prononciation. Et merci, Monsieur uh, Trudeau, uh, pour l'opportunité de laisser uh, parler, laisser la place aux étudiants des sciences infirmières uh, du Canada à, à se prononcer. Donc, euh, je suis du baccalauréat en sciences infirmières à la petite université de Saint-Boniface, ici à Winnipeg. Et puis, euh, ça fait deux ans déjà que je suis dans le programme et j'ai eu la, la grande chance l'année passée de pouvoir justement rejoindre euh, l'équipe à la première ligne euh, des soins de santé dans un centre de soins longue durée, ici à Winnipeg, un petit centre francophone, Action Marguerite saint vital Et puis, euh, donc, j'ai pu, depuis ce temps-là, euh, j'ai commencé pendant la, la pandémie en plein fléau, euh, le 4 mai, pour être juste. Um, et puis, euh, comme Pam, comme Dan, vous avez dit, um, les gens étaient seuls. Les gens, les, les personnes âgées, nos résidents, um, tu sais, day in, day out, uh, n'avaient pas d'interaction, mis à part vraiment les professionnels de la santé, que ce soit nous comme préposés en soins de santé ou bien les infirmières, Um, le, le soutien, um, le, no, les gens qui travaillent là. Um, ça m'a vraiment démontré à quel point um, pour les gens, les, les minorités que nous sommes linguistiques, francophones, à quel point um, l'offre active, comme vous le savez tellement um, dans, les, dans les sites uh, gouvernementaux fédéraux, um, que l'offre active d'offrir les services en français, en anglais, comme la personne le désire, sans avoir besoin de demander, j'ai euh, pu vraiment voir pendant ce temps de pandémie où les familles qui donnent ce confort linguistique-là aux résidents, euh, c'est à nous justement de porter ce flambeau dans, dans ces centres de, de santé. Euh, à maintes reprises que j'ai pu voir euh, des résidents qui, eux, parlent un français très courant, euh, un français 
euh, de, de sainte anne de la broquerie, de petits villages ici et là autour de Winnipeg, euh, qui ont été vraiment rassurés puis vraiment apaisés de, que je puisse leur offrir des services en disant, en disant des expressions comme « mais voyons » ou des expressions genre euh, « ah, oh, la, la petite gueuse, des, des trucs de même, des trucs pour, pour faire, pour plaire aux gens. Um, je trouve que c'est vraiment fort. C'est um, quelque chose que nous, comme infirmiers, infirmières, que ce soit uh, avec ma francophonie ou avec nos, nos, um, nos petits talents cachés ici et là, uh, qu'on peut faire uh, rayonner un peu de joie chez les gens. Je pense que c'est ça que je, je ressors le plus de, du système de santé, de, de ce que les infirmiers et infirmières ont pu donner uh, envers nos patients. Surtout dans ce temps de pandémie où les restrictions et les, um, les interactions avec les familles, surtout pour des gens qui sont institutionnalisés, um, comme nos personnes âgées dans les centres de soins longue durée, um, ont à subir. Donc, um, comme, comme étudiant aussi, je veux vous assurer que um, le futur du Canada est entre bonnes mains. Um, moi et mes collègues, on a, on a très hâte à pouvoir justement rejoindre um, l'équipe um, de première ligne dans les hôpitaux. Au début de la pandémie, euh, moi et plusieurs d'entre mes collègues, nous nous sommes dit euh, à quel point on avait hâte de vouloir rejoindre justement l'équipe parce qu'on voyait le, le travail acharné que les infirmiers et les infirmières au Canada, aux États-Unis, en France, en Espagne, tout partout au monde vraiment, euh, se rejoignaient euh, épaule à épaule pour, euh, pour donner des soins à, à ceux qui l'avaient euh, vraiment besoin. Donc, euh, j'ai hâte de pouvoir voir ce qu'on peut faire de, de notre futur ici au Canada. Merci. Merci, René. Merci d'abord de, de, pour ton, ton enthousiasme qui représente tellement de jeunes qui, qui s'embarquent dans une carrière à un moment particulièrement difficile, mais aussi où vous reconnaissez à quel point on a besoin de votre, votre enthousiasme, votre dynamisme et votre énergie pour, pour aller de l'avant. Et je veux aussi souligner ce que tu es en train de dire par rapport, évidemment, à nos deux langues officielles, l'importance de pouvoir répondre dans, euh, en français à, des, à des, euh, des personnes francophones. Mais ça souligne aussi un plus grand point euh, d'avoir de, de, une diversité, une riche diversité de perspectives et d'expériences euh, en tant que communauté euh, d'infirmiers et d'infirmières pour pouvoir répondre à des, euh, aux, aux patients de façon à, à reconnaître leur identité culturelle, leur identité linguistique, leur background. Euh, C'est un moment d'anxiété quand on est malade, encore plus dans une pandémie, euh, de se faire rassurer que quelqu'un nous comprend dans les subtilités de notre expérience, de notre, notre identité, de notre langue. C'est encore plus important, évidemment, on commence d'abord avec nos deux langues officielles, mais euh, il y a énormément de, de couches d'identité euh, qui devraient être bien représentées à l'intérieur de notre, notre profession euh, infirmière. Alors, euh, je, je te remercie de ton intérêt et euh, de l'engagement de tout le monde de, de garder, euh, ga de rester soi-même euh, avec toute sa diversité à l'intérieur d'une profession qui demande énormément de professionnalisme. Et c'est cet équilibre entre être humain et être un professionnel qui... Euh, euh, qui est à, à l'avant-plan à tous les jours avec, euh, avec le travail extraordinaire que vous faites tous. Merci. Thanks, Prime Minister. And another organization so important to the future of nursing uh, from the Red River College Nursing Students Association, Derek Kolchicki. Derek. Yes. Hi. Uh, thank you for having me, Mr. Dugan and Mr. Trudeau. Uh, so I'm from the Nursing Students Association from Red River College. I'm the president along with uh, Jonathan Luther and I just wanted to share a bit of my experience as a student and just kind of some things that I've heard from a lot of other students, not just in our program, but kind of throughout the province. Um, so this pandemic, it's been a really challenging time for myself and my peers. We've had to go through many adjustments and many accommodations have been had to made uh, in order to adapt to our new style of learning. Everything's online now. We're used to kind of having everything in class. And coming with that has a lot of difficulties. A lot of students are facing a lot of challenges being at home. Uh, a lot of our students have kids, they have pets at home or they have families and it's not always easy for them to deal with things. Uh, so kind of throughout this, as we've been adapting our learning, we've been adapting our curriculums. It just feels like sometimes that the supports we're giving nursing students haven't been adapted that much. Uh, and it's just an area that 
myself and some of my colleagues in the Nursing Students Association have been looking at throughout the pandemic and just trying to improve, trying to provide those students with the supports that they deserve to get through the program as they will be the next generation of nurses. Um, and kind of throughout the third wave and maybe just some other experiences that we've seen throughout the hospitals lately. Uh, from the perspective of a student, we see a lot of the nurses stressed out, overworked, tired every day coming in, but they're, they're heroes. Uh, there's people that we look up to, sorry. <clears throat> they're people that we admire and uh, we come in and like, we think, wow, that's what I want to be. Like, I want to be that person. I want to see those students here and I want to be that person for them. <laughs> sorry. Um, and I just think that I'm grateful that the province and the, gov the federal government is just providing so much support to the nurses and I hope they continue to do so as they uh, really do deserve it. And I know that all the nurses are grateful that us as students are there to help support them and reduce some of the load that they have in the hospital. Um, and as we just kind of continue to move into this third wave and whatever brings us in the, in the future, I just think it's continue that we provide resources and supports for our nursing students across the province, continue to adapt those curriculums, provide supports to the students in these troubling times to help prepare them for the future. Uh, and I just wanted to share one thing. I think this is a common question that myself and a lot of other students get asked is, why are we choosing nursing? We're, great. we're entering a field that is crazy right now. We know we're going to get overworked. We know that there's so much going on. Um, and I think for myself and a lot of my colleagues that I've talked to kind of going along with the theme of this nurses week of answering the call is that we join the profession in mind that people are going to be undergoing tough times, no matter what. And we want to be there to help them reach their goals and provide them with the comfort and stressful or anxious periods, uh, pandemic or not, we're going to be here to do that. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Derek. Thank you for, for highlighting, um, what is so true of your generation. And it certainly applies to uh, all of your peers who stepped up in, in nursing, uh, but it also applies to this generation of young people who are going through this pandemic and understanding how important it is uh, to be part of the solution, to, to be stepping up, to shape the world for the better, to, 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 to make sure uh, that you're having the biggest impact you have. And, and regardless of the career paths that young people are choosing, um, we know that there is a, a, a need and a desire uh, to have the biggest and best impact possible. And as a society, we need to both uh, allow for that and adapt and make sure you're getting the supports from, from virtual you know, supports to, to others. But it also means recognizing that, that students today who've, been, who've gone through this pandemic um, are going to be marked by this for good and for bad for many years to come. And there's things that you won't have received that may leave scars uh, you know, throughout you know, your, your professional career and, and you're building a family in a future. Uh, and there's other things that you will have learned that will uh, make you even more powerful uh, as, as heroes in the coming years. And I think as a society, uh, we need to make sure that you are getting uh, all the tools and all the support and all the resources uh, so that uh, we can count on an extraordinary, uh, a successful uh, healthcare system and society over the coming decades. Uh, that's why as a government, we're really focusing on young people, but I know uh, that that is a sentiment across the country to make sure uh, that we're there to give you all the tools you have when you are, um, young people are growing up very, very fast in this pandemic because we all need you to. Uh, and I know that's sometimes really, really hard, uh, but uh, it is also giving you strength and resilience that is going to leave our world far better off over the coming decades. So thanks for everything you're doing and, and all, the, all the students with you there. Last two speakers, Prime Minister, show us the, uh, the future is in very good hands indeed in the nursing profession. Uh, Prime Minister, our next uh, guest and speaker is from, uh, I must admit, I have a little bias here, is from uh, Victoria General Hospital in my district, the small hospital with a clear vision and a big heart. Um, and Prime Minister, you spoke to them a few weeks ago, and I know they were absolutely thrilled. Uh, so uh, Debbie Linto is with us uh, today. Debbie. You're on mute, Debbie. 
There we go. Still on mute. Ah, there we go. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for having me today. Um, I'm really nervous to talk to talk to all of you, but I'll try my best. Um, hello to Honorable uh, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau. Thank you for this uh, once in a lifetime opportunity to um, speak to you and everybody. Uh, so I was asked to talk about my experience as an RPN um, during this pandemic, um, about the impact of vaccine and uh, the impact of third wave. So when it comes to uh, my experience working during this pandemic, um, it's really been challenging uh, working in the front line. Um, in mental health, health unit, um, we've had to deal with, you know, enforcing visitor uh, restrictions. So no visitors allowed. Um, patients cannot see their families and loved ones. And this can um, extend the length of stay of the patients in the hospital. Uh, but we were connecting the patients with their families via phone phone call or uh, video chat. Um, also, all passes were canceled. Uh, prior to COVID, uh, we would send patients on a day pass or overnight pass or weekend passes just to monitor how they adapt um, back to the community prior to um, fully discharging them. Um, but with COVID, uh, we don't have that option. And then some patients um, have had to stay longer in the hospital uh, due to awaiting services uh, to be in place uh, prior to discharge. And then um, limited recreational activities. Um, group activities is very important um, when our team is evaluating uh, patient progress. And with COVID, recreational activities were limited to uh, smaller groups and restricted outdoor activities. Uh, and I think most of all is the uh, the stress on staff, uh, most especially when there was an outbreak um, upstairs on the other unit. Uh, we were extremely worried that you know it might spread down to our unit, and we're worried that we might get it and then bring it home to our families, and especially the population that we work with. They're very vulnerable and immune compromised. And um, in general, like all nurses, nurses, I think are very exhausted and uh, we've been working tirelessly without a contract for years now, but we continue to show up to work, um, going above and beyond our job, uh, set aside our own fears and anxiety because it is our job to care. And when it comes to the impact of vaccine, um, uh, it's difficult to say right now since the younger uh, population hasn't received theirs, but Hopefully, maybe once the eligibility criteria expands further, then we'll see a change for the better. And when it comes to the third wave, um, it looks like it's going to be worse than the first two. And I'm worried about our unit having more beds or you know, having to be redeployed. Once again, uh, thank you very much for this opportunity. Well, thank you, Debbie. And uh, please say hi to everyone at, at Victoria for me. It was uh, great chatting with them a few weeks ago. Um, yeah, we are all very worried about this third wave uh, that is hitting hard in, in a few places, including Manitoba across the country. Um, we just need to, to pull together and make sure that you're getting the support necessary. Uh, continue to encourage Canadians, uh, even though everyone is tired of these restrictions, uh, to, to minimize their contacts, to stay safe, to know that, uh, that even though vaccines are coming in and more and more vaccines, and that's great that we're getting uh, so many people vaccinated, uh, that, that is a huge piece of it. Uh, but we know we don't get through this third wave until we drive down the case numbers, that uh, vaccinations will allow us to have a bit more of a normal summer, but only if at the same time we also drive down case numbers. So that means hanging in there uh, and uh, preventing all of you from getting overwhelmed uh, in our healthcare systems uh, and individual uh, uh, citizens being very, very careful so that we can all uh, uh, have, a, have a better summer uh, and uh, get back as normal as possible in the fall. Um, you know, just uh, just make sure. Let's all make sure that we're we're passing those messages and that we are encouraging everyone uh, to get uh, to get vaccinated. We're seeing uh, uh, great numbers in that, but we're also seeing that uh, places around the world that start to hit that 50, 60 percent uh, mark in terms of first doses, they start to plateau. And we know we need to get more than that. So, uh, uh, as much as I can tell people to get vaccinated 
probably rightly, they tend to trust you more. Uh, so uh, as you continue to encourage uh, as, uh, as healthcare professionals, uh, your friends, your colleagues, uh, everyone uh, in your communities to get, to, to get vaccinated, uh, we will get to where we need to be, driving down cases and, uh, and uh, multiplying vaccines across the country. Good point, uh, Prime Minister. Uh, the last in our uh, first round of speakers, uh, we're going to hear from uh, Tracy Teal from the College of Registered Psychiatric Nurses of, of Manitoba. Uh, Tracy. Hi, uh, thank you for this opportunity. I just want to start off by saying how proud I am to be part of such an amazing profession. These stories I'm hearing are I thought, holy schmucks, I'm not going to be able to talk when it's uh, my turn because you guys are truly amazing. And I'm so um, proud of your commitment for the safe patient care and the personal sacrifices that you've done over the last, unbelievable over the last year are truly amazing. So uh, well done, everyone. As a registered psychiatric nurse, we've seen COVID affect everyone in so many ways and not being able to see family and friends. And as healthcare professionals, we're seeing so much pain. We're seeing so much death this past year. But one of the biggest impacts we're see seeing is the impact of isolation. With closure of so many of our community resources, we're seeing the impact on the individuals that we care for. And absolutely, we need these restrictions. We need to keep our communities safe. We need to follow these restrictions. We need to get vaccinated. But that social interaction, that ability for individuals to build their life skills are just as important as that physical care, uh, getting their medications and therapy. Absolutely, virtual care has expanded during COVID and that is actually really fantastic and has opened up a lot of great opportunities for care uh, in nursing. But within psychiatric nursing, we really work with a vulnerable population that doesn't have access to technology. And if they do, they don't have a safe place to be able to use that technology. And it makes it really hard uh, as uh, RPNs to be able to deliver care we know that we need to give our patients. RPNs are truly nimble on how we, pair, uh, prepare care, how we provide care to meet the population um, and their care needs. Not only today, but in the future, we're starting to slowly see the long-term impacts of, of COVID and on the healthcare system. And we really need to start building the foundation of a workforce. We actually need to start um, strategizing with a post-COVID um, mental health strategic plan. And with this workforce, we need to be able to meet the healthy, um, meet the mental health needs of Canadians. RPNs, not only are we celebrating Nurses Week, but actually RPNs are celebrating 100 years as a profession uh, in Western Canada. But we need to actually keep expanding that across Canada to work within our collaborative healthcare teams to build a really strong um, mental health strategy to make an impact on getting uh, Canada healthy again. And part of this isolation and, and building a healthy uh, future uh, post-COVID is the support of our children and of our teachers. Um, as an RPN and also as a mom, I do see the impact that we're um, seeing on our younger generation on the learning from home, uh, the isolation. We do have registered psychiatric nurses that are working in pockets within our healthcare system. I mean, in our school system, which is fantastic but we need to build on that more. We need to support our families. We need to support our teachers. We really need to build healthy communities. Mental health is so important and will continue to be as we continue to fight COVID um, together. But for us to do this um, as an RPN, I see the goal that what we need is we actually need to work towards eliminating the shame towards mental health. Individuals are going to have to need to seek that care that they need now. We need them to be able to feel comfortable coming forward and getting this care. So we need to start working in this strategic um, plan um, post-COVID to replace that shame with, with compassion, with communication, with understanding uh, and education, and definitely having registered psychiatric nurses as part of the planning and moving us forward to make Canada healthy again. Uh, is a wonderful uh, next step and definitely um, something that we would uh, love to be part of. So I just want to, again, uh, thank everyone for this opportunity. It's so great to see some of my colleagues uh, on the call today and uh, 
especially some of uh, Renee and Derek, some of our uh, younger nurses, uh, welcome to the profession uh, and definitely has been an interesting year for you to join, but uh, you're, you're going to love it. So um, thank you. Thank you, Tracy. And, uh, you know, I can't help but think if this year is nursing week, this week is nursing week, last week was mental health week and the opportunity to talk about the impact uh, that this pandemic has had on people, uh, but also, you know, thinking about the lingering impacts that are going to last a lot longer than uh, the acuteness of this, uh, this pandemic uh, uh, on, uh, on people's mental health. I think we've seen uh, over the past number of years a, a real advance in terms of destigmatization uh, a lot of people, particularly young people, willing uh, to put up their hand and say, you know what, I need help right now. The problem is we've had a system that has uh, was already on the edge of being overloaded, uh, even when the stigma around mental health uh, kept people, a large number of people silent. As more and more people are putting up their hands, um, we find the system even further stretched. So there's gonna be a need for new investments, for new approaches to make sure that we are able to respond to someone uh, who, who, uh, who needs help uh, and understanding the, the, the integrated way and the uh, strong way we need to respond to mental health challenges is going to be huge uh, on a personal level uh I know this yesterday was mother's day of course as you mentioned tracy and and uh, uh i talked to my mom and i will say that even with uh you know with uh, all the all the support we're trying to send her uh i haven't seen her in in many 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 months uh and the isolation uh is really really tough uh on uh, on on a whole bunch of people and uh you know thank you for uh, uh for everything you're doing and and folks across the country are doing to support uh, uh people uh, like my mom who've uh, who found this uh, especially difficult who are already facing challenges but uh, we just need to keep being there for everyone that is just so important so thank you uh, thanks, Prime Minister. We've heard from uh, all eight uh, organizations who joined us today now. Uh, our time is winding down. I think we have only eight or nine uh, minutes left. So we have a, we have a couple of more uh, folks who I think might have a comment or a question for you. Uh, we have to be pretty brief, and then we'll hear briefly from our MPs and, and uh, last word to you. But uh, Sharon, uh, thank you for joining us. Sharon's with the Association of Regulated Nurses of Manitoba, and Sylvia Daigneault uh, is from the L'École des Sciences Infirmières et des Études de la Santé. Sharon. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much uh, to Minister Carr and to the Prime Minister for his kind words. I'm a registered psychiatric nurse and I'm also an assistant professor at Brandon University in the Department of Psychiatric Nursing. And as you know, um, in our province, post-secondary education is under threat for funding. As Pam said earlier, uh, we cannot in this province afford to lose even one cohort of, new, of nursing students. Um, so I would just like to encourage everyone to speak to their MPs uh, to ensure that funding continues. Our students have, have, have answered the call. They've risen up to meet extraordinary challenges, balancing their own mental health and their physical health and uh, working in COVID areas, uh, taking on the same responsibilities as their registered and regulated colleagues. And I, uh, they've shown great resilience. And similarly, the faculty. Um, getting our programs up online, uh, countless, countless extra hours of ensuring that our students don't lose their year or their clinical hours. Um, they've demonstrated great res uh, resilience as well. And um, so I know I don't have long, but anyway, just uh, thank you and keep our students and, and university faculty in mind as well. Sylvia? Hi, merci beaucoup. Thank you so much for having me today. Um, je veux juste appuyer un peu ce que mon collègue René avait dit. Um, nous sommes tellement en admiration de tous les professionnels de la santé à qui on a eu l'opportunité de travailler avec cette année. Et aussi, um, juste dire que um, nous avons tellement hâte de les rejoindre à la première ligne. Um, most people know that university students have had a particular challenge this year, having to um, go online and in nursing in particular. It is theory, but there's also a lot of hands-on. My sisters are personally really tired of me chasing them around with my stethoscope <laughs> around the house. Um, 
and it's got its particular sets of challenges, but nursing students are um, very motivated and passionate individuals. Pre, um, you know, we're gonna get through this all together. Pre, um, I was just wondering if uh, Mr. Trudeau, you maybe had any uh, words of wisdom or in of encouragement for us. Just, uh, just that I, I continue to be incredibly inspired by uh, Canadians. You know, it's, it's, it, you know, being, uh, uh, being in any position of, of leadership during a, a historic crisis like this is going to be a challenge. But I look at some of our colleagues around the world uh, who don't have the good fortune of serving Canadians, uh, and they're having a lot tougher time of it because, you know, we, we are good neighbors. We're there for each other as, as citizens, uh, and seeing Canadians step up in so many amazing ways. Uh, is inspiring to me and I think uh, uh, you need to take uh, take strength in that knowing that we will come through this we will learn these the lessons that we need to and we will uh, uh, make sure we're moving forward in even better ways uh, the future will be brighter we will get through this uh, even though we're uh, we're in for a, a few more tough weeks uh, for sure well uh Thank you, Prime Minister, and I'm, I'm going to have to issue an apology here. Uh, our time has gone uh, so quickly. Uh, thank you all uh, so much for those amazing comments and reflections. We're, we're just all so incredibly grateful for your courage and service day in and day out. As we come to a close, I, I'd now like to ask our Manitoba MPs just to say a few words, uh, and then uh, we'll conclude with the Prime Minister. Um, so let's start with uh, Kevin Lamroux. Kevin? Thank you, Terry. And you know, it's quite an amazing thing to look at my computer monitor and, and see some wonderful people. You know, I can make reference to the Prime Minister, but most importantly, I see a hundred plus nurses that have been serving Manitobans so well. And, you know, what, what, what can one say but just to genuinely express uh, our love and appreciation and to say thank you to each and every one of you for the things that you are doing to be able to make life that much more manageable. You know, uh, Pam talks about those many stories. You know, Dan, in a very emotional way, talked about the, you know, the, the senior that's dying or the individual dying without family there. Um, you know, Shauna talks about the need for additional nurse practitioners and, and the need to, to be there for the backbone of our healthcare system. I can tell you that we needed what the Prime Minister said, extraordinary efforts. And the nurses of Manitoba and, in fact, all of Canada have risen to the challenge. And in one word or two words, the best thing I could say is thank you very, very much. And next we'll go to Dan Van Dell. Thank you so much, Terry. And, and thank you to everyone for sharing uh, this time with us. Je me lève tous vous remercier d'avoir pris le temps de nous joindre pour partager vos expériences, vos préoccupations avec nous. Merci au Premier ministre puis les autres députés fédéraux du Manitoba. Un shout out à René Pichet, un ancien de collège Louis Riel au Nord Saint-Boniface, sur mon mon ancienne école aussi, et un, un récipiendaire de, de mon prix de la jeunesse pour l'initiative jeunesse en 2019. Ça fait que continue le bon travail, René et Sylvie. And what can I say? I'm just so proud to be a Winnipegger, a Manitoban during this really, this unprecedented time that we're all going through. And it makes me feel, uh, feel so much better that, uh, uh, myself, my family, my friends are, are being served on the front lines by, by the nurses that are, that are here this morning, this afternoon, but also the thousands that are not. And just uh, keep up the great work. We're going through unprecedented times, but we will get through this. We will get through this together. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. And uh, last but not least, uh, Dan, um, Jim Carr. Prime Minister, every story was enriched by the contact that nurses have had with patients over these many months. And all of those contacts are special and unique to that relationship. But I'm struck by how much commonality there is. And the commonality is the human dimension, the nourishment, the caring, and the uh, selflessness uh, that's so much on display by these heroes in the front line. 
And I'm so pleased, Prime Minister, that you've had a chance to firsthand, however virtually, to become closer to those relationships that really are the essential work of healthcare professionals in Manitoba in a very, very difficult moment and so many special people. So, Prime Minister, over to you for the last word. And thank you so much for sharing this last hour with us. Uh, thank you, Jim. Thank you, Terry, Kevin, and Dan. Uh, but mostly, thank you to all of you who've uh, joined us today. Uh, vous faites un travail extraordinaire, uh, extrêmement difficile, uh, pénible des fois, mais toujours tellement important. Uh, que vous savez à quel point vous êtes en train de sauver des vies, de faire une différence réelle dans la vie des gens, et pour ça nous sommes uh, tellement reconnaissants. I think there there is going to be a need for an awful lot of reflections uh, after uh, this pandemic is all said and done. Uh, reflections around how uh, governments could have handled things differently, reflections on uh, you know, how resilient our societies can and need to be. But I think there's going to be a huge reflection on just how uh, our frontline health workers, particularly our nurses, uh, stepped up uh, in an incredibly difficult time with uh, sometimes not all the tools and supports that they would have needed. Uh, and I think as we move forward uh, into the coming decades, uh, we're going to have to make sure we are doing right uh, by all of you who have done so right uh, by all Canadians. Merci pour tout ce que vous avez fait. I see uh, lots of hands still up, and I uh, really wish uh, we had time to uh, engage more. But I can tell you uh, that these uh, four MPs uh, on this, this call uh, want to hear from you, want to continue to engage with you all. Uh, and uh, my, uh, my ability to respond uh, and uh, move forward in the right way together as a country uh, has been immensely uh, facilitated by the unbelievable work uh, people on the ground have done, uh, including our MPs, at collecting stories and issues to make sure we're filling gaps, uh, to make sure that the federal government continues to be there uh, to support people all across the country with unprecedented supports. Uh, but just because they were unprecedented in the past doesn't mean uh, they're going to have to be uh, even more going forward. Uh, we need to come out of this pandemic stronger and ready for whatever, including potential other pandemics that may be thrown at us in the decades to come. Um, and that means listening to all of you about what we really need to build in terms of resilient, uh, resilient societies. Thank you uh, so much. Well, uh, like the Prime Minister, uh, I'm just so sorry we couldn't get to all of your questions, but uh, do know that all of the MPs that are on the screen today, uh, we're here for you, so don't hesitate to reach out. And, and Prime Minister, uh, thank you. Uh, it's been some dark days as we once uh, again see a spike in cases here in Manitoba. So thanks for, for picking up our spirits by being with us today. Uh, thank you for listening. Uh, thank you for caring. Uh, and we know that uh, with the amazing nurses like we've heard from uh, today, we'll get to the other side of this crisis together. And as you would say, uh, with hope and hard work, uh, better days are indeed ahead. So happy National Nursing Week, everyone. Thanks so much for being with us. Have a great afternoon. Thanks so much.